Hello, everyone. Uh, I am here today to discuss the first part of Haley Williams' album, Pedals for Armor, which she has decided to release in three EPs, so five songs each, I'm assuming. And uh, the full album will be out on May 8th, but we have the first part um, out, which is five songs, two of which we'd already heard. They were kind of thought of to be singles. And now she's just kind of giving us the album in these chunks. And, um, you know, it's a unique way to deliver a project that I think more artists are experimenting with. And honestly, I don't have any problem with it. I like getting the album in small spoonfuls. Um, and I think that, you know, especially since there's so many visuals attached to the songs, it kind of helps us digest and tell the story in a sort of more, uh, you know, linear way um, so that we're sort of guided along slowly down this journey. Um, and so we do, do get another music video for the song Cinnamon, um, but we don't get music videos for the two other songs. I don't know if there will be music videos for those songs to come. I'm not entirely sure if there's a music video still for every single song. Don't think there is, but I do think that at least half the songs are going to have visuals. Um, so we'll see where, we'll see where things go or what we'll, we'll see coming down the pike from her. But I have already talked about the first two tracks, Simmer and Leave It Alone. So I will briefly discuss them, but I'm mainly going to be talking about the last three tracks, Cinnamon, Creepin, and Sudden Desire. But before I get into that, I want to discuss what has been going on, um, particularly on Twitter. Um, and I want to discuss the sort of controversy that has unfortunately sort of uh, starting to overshadow this release. Um, and that has to do with the uh, concept of plagiarism and whether Haley Williams and particularly the visuals, the cinematography, the staging, the production of it, whether, um, and the costuming and choreography to a certain extent, whether it is ripping off another artist named Yona Lee, who is a Swedish artist, a Swedish electronic alternative artist who I have talked about loads on this channel. I am a huge Yona Lee fan. I got into her music, of course, later in her career, but uh, she's been making music for 10 years. Previously, as the moniker, I am, am I, who am I? A lot of the visuals that are said to be sort of ripped off are more from the I am, am I projects than the Yona Lee projects. But in doing the research and then looking at all the visuals, particularly for the, late, the last music video we just got, Cinnamon, there's parallels between almost every era of Yona Lee's career. And so I want to discuss this. I want to present sort of both sides. I don't want to, you know, I want to play a bit of devil's advocate here. Um, this is a really unfortunate sort of clusterfuck of a situation. And, you know, as much as there's a small part of me that lives for the drama, it's a little interesting to see, you know, Yona Lee and Haley Williams feuding online, even though I wouldn't want to call it feuding, but it's sort of been turned into that by people on Twitter to be expected. Um, but I want to address, you know, this whole controversy because this, this is an issue that is very, very prevalent in pop music, alternative music, all forms of music. Um, but it is one that's becoming, I think, even more so of an issue because of the sheer volume and amount of creative content that is out there. You know, did the artist intentionally rip off the work? meaning they knew of that artist and were taking them and taking their work and not giving credit for it? Or is this all just a real unfortunate coincidence? And so I'm going to present both sides of that argument because to be completely honest, I'm not entirely sure where I sit on this debate. On the one hand, I can see where Yona Lee is coming from and why she made that tweet, which is partly what has incited this firestorm, particularly from fans of Haley Williams and Paramore, um, and has actually elicited a response from Haley herself on her Instagram. It's me. I just, um, I feel like I need to come on and make a video to address some tweets that I've seen come through. I think at some point today, an artist accused me of plagiarizing her work. Um, I was very shocked by that accusation. Um, and even more so because I did not know who this artist was and that's no slight to this artist because now that I know of them they seem pretty brilliant um, but I, you know look this shit happens a lot in creative spaces we're all humans feeding off raw human emotion and we're putting them into our creative works and I've seen this happen 
countless times with Paramore when we've seen other people create things that feel similar to things that the band created ourselves. It just happens. And um, I think I, really I'm, I'm mostly just, it just happens. And um, I think I, really I'm, I'm mostly just sorry to fans. Um, I think it puts you guys in an awkward position. Um, I wanted to play that clip to sort of uh, give you the context here. Haley's very sort of open and transparent, and I do believe her when she says she has not heard of Yona Lee up until this point. Um, when I had been initially watching Simmer Down and Leave It Alone, I was thinking, you know, more so with the visuals, I'm getting a strong vibe of I am, am I, who am I? There's a lot of, you know, similar kind of tropes that are being used. But with those first two visuals, I didn't think it had crossed any form of line of plagiarism. I mean, I was also seeing influence from Bjork. I was seeing influence from, you know, Kate Bush and so many other female artists, Stevie Nicks. Um, you know, I mean, it, this whole story that, that Haley is giving us is so deeply personal and in odd ways specific. You know, this is a story and a visual and a creative project that is so purely Haley. It's really hard. Up until we got the cinnamon video, it was really hard for me to think anything more of it than just like, well, you know, I mean, Yona Lee doesn't own running in a forest. Yona Lee doesn't own necessarily the idea of a cocoon, um, just like Bjork doesn't own that either. Or, you know, being in a white room, you know, or, you know, wrapped in a towel or some sort, you know, like these are there's just, there are some similarities and, you know, I think that they're easy to make, but they actually are like great pieces that are in conversation with one another. But then I did see the music video for Cinnamon. And I also saw the interlude that sort of led us into Cinnamon because all of those singles have these short little video interludes, which I think are absolutely brilliant. They're really haunting and kind of eerie. And they do remind me a lot of the sort of art house style of you know, uh, weird camera angles and uneasy sort of turns of the narrative with Yona, with I Am Am I's earlier music videos, because they also had interludes and parts. And um, there's, you know, even the breathiness of her vocals. Like, the sad thing is, is I feel like if I really did want to go down the rabbit hole, I could make an argument for a lot of stuff that I could say, Yona Lee did that, I Am Am I did that, you know, might be a little bit different, but the problem is, is that there's the sheer volume of subject matter and content that is seeming to parallel. You know, I saw some people on Twitter saying, you know, comparing, you know, all of these images and so showing how other artists have done these things too. But they had like six or seven different examples of, you know, imagery and visuals that um, she was referencing other artists. Yona Lee and I Am was in every single category, whereas other artists only appeared maybe once or twice. Every single shot, almost every single shot from a lot of these visuals could be in some form, you know, some of it being a little bit more of a stretch than others, referencing an I Am Am I visual. And that's where the issue lies. Now, as I said, Haley has said she has no idea who this artist is. So I truly believe that Haley is completely innocent here and had no clue what was going on. Um, you know, there's an a actual director and team behind all visuals. You know, as much as we like to think that particularly solo artists are these independent artists and that everything they do, they have 100% say over. I mean, there is an actual director of cinematography. And for this case, these visuals are directed by Warren Fu. Um, and what kind of has sort of escalated this drama beyond just Haley possibly like, you know, all Haley needed to say. And by the way, let me just backtrack. The reason why this all kind of came to a head is like I said, we, we I, you know, I noticed this. Other fans were noticing that there were similarities in the visuals between Yona Lee and, and Haley's. And um, then Yona Lee actually posted on Instagram and on Twitter, she said, you know, to no extent, plagiarism is never cool. Use your own mind and body. Um, and it was, honestly, it was really uh, direct and um, provocative uh, thing for Yona Lee to say. 
And so this is where I am a little bit on the fence. You know, I am, like I said, I need to precursor this. I am a huge Yona Lee fan. Yona Lee is, you know, a really well-known artist in the sort of alternative indie electronic sphere, particularly in Scandinavia, but also in Brazil and in gay circles, um, in, among introverts. Uh, she is a really actually more well-known artist than I think some people want to give her credit for, even though she's not mainstream like Haley Williams is. Most people are not going to know who she is compared to Haley Williams. And so um, she's coming across as this unknown. Um, and, you know, for all intents and purposes, if you want to compare, yes, you know, Yona Lee is very much an underdog. She always has been in the industry and she is criminally underrated. And so it's always a lot more sort of compelling for me to want to side with the underdog who is being copied who doesn't have nearly as many streams on Spotify or doesn't have the huge record label behind them and all the money and support. Um, so, you know, it's hard seeing an artist like Yona Lee get attacked by Haley Williams fans calling her, you know, this nobody who's trying to, you know, get a, get a few clicks on her page and some streams on her music video, you know, music and stuff. Um, and, you know, I do believe that Yona felt, you know, strongly enough about this whole situation to call her out. And honestly, I'm quite surprised because, you know, she's not necessarily one to wade into these waters. You know, she's much more off of social media in that regard. I'm sure she's the last one who wants to pit women against women and kind of create this cat fight. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, I really do feel like on Yona's part, this must have really hurt for her to actually say that and make that statement knowing the backlash she was going to get, she must have just felt like she was really backed up into a corner and felt it was just completely against her morals and character to not speak up and say something. And so on the one hand, I completely understand why she felt the need to speak up. However, you know, it's a really iffy gray area situation that we are dealing with. Was she right in calling this out publicly instead of trying to discuss this privately first? And was it directly calling it like without a shadow of a doubt plagiarism, without, you know, necessarily from what we know, engaging with that behind the scenes dialogue to find out maybe more from the creative team and do some investigations, you know, obviously knowing if Haley had anything to do with this. I mean, I don't think Yona actually took the time to sort of figure that issue out. Because if I were her, that's something I would want to figure out. I would probably want to try and contact the team and sort of say, look, here, who should I be pointing the finger at? Is it unfair for me to target Haley? Or should I be targeting Warren Fu? Now, again, where the controversy becomes deeper is that Warren Fu has been found to be subscribed to IMMI's YouTube channel. Um, and that is a really kind of weird coincidence, given that artist is not, that director is not necessarily following a ton, you know, they're following a selective group of obviously we would presume visual artists that they are inspired by and a fan of. So Haley does not know who Yona Lee is, but Warren Fu does from without from what the evidence is suggesting. And so the one, the person who has a huge say in a lot of the costuming, a lot of the set pieces, a lot of the visual stuff. I mean, Haley's input is still extremely important and part of this process. But, you know, the, the director can, you know, take artistic licenses and suggest things. And, you know, it's a co it's a teamwork effort. Um, and I'm sure Haley and Warren have a really strong relationship where they trust each other. And they're sort of like, hey, I have this idea. Could, you know, Haley brings this up as like ideas for what she wants to do in the visual. And she says, I trust you. Can you help translate this vision to screen for me? You know, and I'll trust your decisions on what costumes we'll have these characters wear, what certain shots will look like, um, what the setting will be. You know, she Haley's probably giving like some basic key things that she wants in there. And then Warren is filling in a lot of these gaps and details, I'm assuming. And so, like I said, this, this just becomes really kind of sketchy because... Like I said, there is just so many instances of frame by frame comparisons that, again, a few of them really wouldn't have batten an eye. But seeing just almost so 
many frames having these direct influences. Um, it did, I mean, you know, I, I personally was just like, wow, whoever is in charge of this or Haley must be a huge I am, am I fan, you know, cause that was what I was thinking. I was just like, I mean, you know, you know, Haley has been so open about her influences, but she never mentioned that artist's name. And I was like, does she know who she is? Does she aware that this is, this is so similar? Are these things, even if they are similar intellectual property to the point that they're so specific and original to Yona Lee? How many of those tropes, like the skin tight, you know, body costumes and certain shots in a bathtub and certain shots in a forest running in the snow or, you know, um, are all are so many of these shots directly, you know, original enough to for Yona Lee to consider it plagiarizing? And so this is a big controversy. I am really, you know, I've seen people on both ends come to each other's defense I'm really right in the middle right now. And um, I want to support both of those artists. And I, you know, I mean, I feel bad for Haley because like I said, she, I really do believe she had no clue that this was going to create this kind of firestorm. And unfortunately, like, you know, like she says in her video, I mean, she has all the respect in the world for Yona. I think she's checked out some of her stuff and she's blown away. I'm sure she's thinking, you know, oh, I see comparisons, but of course for her, it's like, I didn't, you know, how was I to know, you know, but it's like, well, talk to your director, um, because you might want to clear this up to clear your own name, um, because I don't know how much Haley can take responsibility for these things if she really didn't know. If, if things get ugly and things turn into a possible lawsuit situation, which I know some people might think, oh my God, there's no way this is going to go that far. You know, Yona Lee's not that vindictive. I mean, you know, I have seen a lot of Yona Lee fans commenting on Twitter and on Facebook pages suggesting that she should sue. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying it's a possibility. I really, really did not think it would be a possibility, but I mean, that was such a direct call out statement from Yona. I mean, that was, that was like a kind of I'm pissed off statement. Um, and I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a tricky situation for both parties. Um, and it's just really unfortunate because it is, I mean, and I, I think, you know, Haley will always be a lot more mainstream. And I think a lot of this is like people who are like, a, a lot of this is like, you know, people on Twitter kind of going deep down rabbit holes. So I don't think the general public is aware of this, but this is overshadowing Haley's release and it's unfortunate. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't, I also, it's unfortunate that we get a lot of, we are having a lot of Haley fans and Paramore fans attacking Yona Lee. Um, but unfortunately when you're, it's, it's like, do I blame them? Do I, I mean, I, I think, are they being too extreme? Probably yes. They need to like look at her from her perspective. You know, this is a woman who did this stuff years ago and, you know, is rightfully a little concerned and wants to raise the perspective of, you know, this, well, from, I mean, that tweet, there was no gray area. This is plagiarism. I mean, I guess if Haley had credited Yona sort of like, you know, in a paper, when you use a citation, it's not plagiarizing because you're providing sources. So is that what Yona Lee is just pissed about? Is the fact that, you know, Haley or someone behind her team didn't say, you know, we were in an interview, you know, we were really inspired by I am am I's visuals here. And we wanted to, you know, uh, pay homage to that and then tell her own story in the similar sort of a cinematic narrative you know, and then, of course, that's telling people about her, and it's promoting both artists, and it's a great symbiotic relationship. Um, you know, some people are attacking Yona, saying she's doing this, just like I said, to get clicks on her music, and to be fair, it is going to get a lot of people to start viewing her stuff, um, but to attack it, you know, it's not exactly good attention, and so... You know, sonically, I don't think there's any strong argument for sonic similarities. I mean, yes, Yona Lee has a song, Simmer Down. But, 
I mean, come on, if we're going to start, you know, but like I said, I mean, unfortunately, it's not helping the case that there are these other similarities. Um, and, you know, the sort of more alternative vocal style, it's, it's not really at all similar to Yona Lee's music. But I could see someone extrapolating that and just adding that as a pile of evidence that like, well, you could make the case that, you know, she's kind of taking influence from Yona Lee's vocal delivery and the sort of odd syncopated, you know, breathy, um, melancholic, you know, it's, it's really, really reaching. And I do not support that one bit because listening to these five songs, which I want to get to talking about, you know, as five songs together was really like, this is its own thing. I mean, this doesn't sound to me anywhere similar enough to Yona Lee to be considered, you know, a problem. Um, so sonically, I really don't want that to be a part of this a conversation. Um, and it seems like most people aren't taking that there. But like I said, it's all about these visuals and particularly with the cinnamon video, you know, the dancing, the, I can see the argument. I can see the argument, but I can also, I also can see, you know, how possibly Yona maybe shouldn't have tweeted that. Maybe she should have worded it differently so that it wasn't so emphatically like, I believe this is plagiarism. You're in the wrong. You need to apologize to me. Um, because that's what was implied. And it didn't allow room for more positive discussion. It was more starting reactive, vindictive discussion. And I never like to see that between two amazingly original, creative, talented female artists. It's the last thing I want to see um, is each other's work getting soiled by this. Um, and so I guess I'll just leave it there. I mean, I want to know what you guys think in the comments. Like, where do you think this is heading? I really, really hope that this can all be settled and that, you know, Yona can make some sort of public statement to sort of calm things down a little bit. Because as much as I do feel for Yona, you know, she's very protective of her hard work. You know, it is, I mean, on, it is very original, even though people are like, oh, Yona copied this from other artists. I'm like, oh, come on, we're all reaching here. Like I said, it's just, it's an uncomfortable, what I believe, uncomfortable coincidence. And I do think that Warren Fu, the director, should come forward. And I do think that there should be some dialogue between Yona and the creative director. Um, because I do think there is more to discuss to discuss there. But as far as Haley is concerned, I just feel bad for her. And I, you know, I'm, I don't want to even make in this video, like, I don't want to fuel the fire. Like, I don't want to make this, you know, it, it's hard. I just wanted to sort of investigatively dis dissect what's going on for those of you who aren't aware. And um, I hope that this all gets resolved because I really don't like seeing this kind of feud, especially against an artist that I feel so protective over because, you know, I really do love Yona's music. And um, for Haley fans, you know, if you want to know my opinion on it, I got lots of reviews of her stuff on my channel you can check out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just, that's what I'm going to say about that. Um, I think I touched on everything I wanted to say. Um, hopefully this all gets resolved. So let's talk about this, these five songs. So the first thing I want to say is that Simmer has grown on me exponentially. Listening to it just now amongst the concept context of the five songs, I am so much more down with Simmer than I was upon its first release. It's a great intro song into the album because like I said, it's just a palette teaser and it introduces us to the style of the record, but it's like anxious and frantic and at the same time sweet and kind of inviting in parts with the more sort of stripped back guitar compared to the more kind of rhythmic guitar stuff. It's a really great intro track and I am definitely a fan of it now. Um, and of course, Leave It Alone, the second track I reviewed, and I'll link both of these reviews in the description, by the way, my review for Simmer and Leave It Alone so you can find out more of what I had to say about those songs. Leave It Alone is my favorite song so far released from Pedals for Armor. You know, it, it just... It's the song that has the most emotive qualities to me. It's the song that has the most memorable chorus. It's just, it's the it song for me right now. And it's the one that I'm in most in my feels and most in love with Haley's delivery from. Now, track three, Cinnamon. Visuals aside, but I saw it with the visuals, Cinnamon is kind of a lot. And it definitely picks up the tempo. It picks up the dynamic. 
because now we're starting to get Haley into a little bit more of, you know, her more familiar sort of brazen shout, shouty vocals that she did on Paramore. It's, you know, some very sort of abrasive yowling coming from Haley here to sort of syncopate the rhythm around this track. And it's not for everyone. You know, it's definitely very alternative experimental. And um, I can see it appealing to, you know, fans of artists like Bjork and, you know, uh, artists like Kate, you know, artists that really sort of stretch what it means to have like a pretty vocal and sort of distort everything, but like at the same time, make it dancey, but it's like unsyncopated dancey. Um, you know, a visual reference that is not a Yona Lee reference um, is the picture frames that she has the empty picture frames hung up on the wall of this house she's dancing in, which is supposed to symbolize her home um, and sort of her domestic life. Um, Cause she sings about her dog, um, the walls around her, her, her everyday life. Um, but those picture frames that's referencing the uh, album art for brand new eyes, the 2009 Paramore album. See, that's such thing, you know, there's so much referencing past Paramore projects. It's like the last thing they were thinking about was Yona Lee and I am, pro you know, I am, am I? But Warren Fu. Anyway, um, eat my breakfast in the nude, lemon water living room. Home is where I'm feminine, smells like citrus and cinnamon. This is, like I said, it's, it's, it's a kind of catty, witchy track, you know? Um, and uh, I appreciate the energy behind it. Um, but sonically, it's not one that I really feel drawn to, to come back. I would only listen to it in the context of the whole project. Um, and as a song leading us to the next, that's unfortunately how I feel just because I don't feel like melodically it's there at all. But I have to ask myself, is that really the point? Does every single song have to have such an identifiable melody, you know? Um, does every song have to flow like that? And that's a real thing I've been grappling with. Like, what makes it good? I mean, I know that's subjective, right? Um, so it comes down to personal taste, I think, whether you're going to resonate with this song more or not. Okay, so the other song I really like is Creepin', um, because this is a song that brings a lot of attitude that, um, you know, the album kind of is a bit sleepy, or it's like very kind of erratic with cinnamon. But then the attitude that creeps in with Creep In, um, at first I thought, you know, this was about, you know, her talking about uh, a guy that's like not letting her go. But when you realize that she's singing, you know, like a vampire, I can't stop sucking from the memory of him. So she's singing about herself. Um, and so she's singing about these thoughts, these recurring thoughts of wanting to be with someone from the past, you know, and how uh, it's really bad for her to crave this connection because it's long gone and it's only brings her down. There are a lot of ways you could interpret this, you know, it could be also interpreted, you know, as about an abusive relationship um, and this guy who keeps returning um, and you can't, you know, you know, you shouldn't be with him. But then at the end of the day at night, you know, you fight and then you kiss and it's just like, oh, what am I doing? Um, so there's this real vitriol behind this track. It's a little bit more electronic in parts. Like it's, it's edging into mainstream territory, which I think is quite welcome. Um, it's not so acoustic and that's fine because I like seeing Haley sort of experiment. It's still, it's unique. And like I said, it's, it's very sort of a uh, darker and uh, moodier in a way that's different from Simmer, which is like kind of mellow, but like frantic. This is more aggressive and um, transgressive in a way. So this is where we get some of those higher belting vocals from Haley. Um, highs and lows. That's really what this song kind of dynamic wise is giving us. You know, it's close and intimate and then it's rumbling and there's this deep brew kind of bass kind of underneath her soaring kind of angry vocals. It's probably the most punk song we've seen so far on this record. Take the elephant by the hand and hold it. It's cruel to tame a thing that don't know its strength, but better to walk beside it than underneath. Don't look in my eyes. I feel a sudden desire. Don't know if I can deny a sudden desire. Uncontrollable lust. I definitely know a thing or two about this. Um, wanting to sort of avoid a situation where you will feel those feelings because of how self-destructive that can kind of be. Perpetuating a relationship that you know, kind of going off of creeping. It's sort of like, this is explaining the moment that she realizes that she can't turn away. There's this magnetic attraction um, that's 
more carnal and less sort of uh, emotional. And uh, it's not, it's, it's ultimately not probably going to serve you in the end, but we all are slaves to our desires. Um, and so she's grappling with this and you can really hear that in the delivery. Um, and so it shows that sort of pent up frustration, um, I think pretty strongly. Uh, and again, melodically, I think this song is more about just expressing that pent up frustration. Um, it's not so much about uh, catching a memorable melody line, but that's okay. My favorite songs are Leave It Alone and Simmer and somewhat Creepin. Um, I'm curious to see where the album takes us. Like I said, I'm not sure if we're going to get music videos for Creepin and Sun Desire. Maybe, maybe not. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments. I'm really excited to see where the rest of this album goes. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully this whole issue with plagiarizing content um, gets resolved quickly and painlessly because... Uh, I hate to see either artist get dragged through the mud with this um, and have this turn into a bigger issue. As much as, you know, do I think it should just be all swept under the rug? Like I said, Warren Fu, you have some questions to answer. Um, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about that. So let me know in the comments all your thoughts on all of these things. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, and I will review part two after that is released. Might be a month from now, a month and a half. Not sure. Um, we'll see. And uh, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful, blessed day. Peace, love, and light. Bye.